like the lady over here. <laughs> People that buy a house and then they go, why did I buy this house? <laughs> you never tell me that. Oh, never. Well, they wouldn't tell the realtor, no. They probably just told each other. But there is such a thing called buyer's remorse. Maybe not buying a house. Maybe you buy an appliance, you get home, you go, why did we, or a car, why did we? I had preacher's remorse. Not in a bad way, but I went home and I went, there was so much more in that chapter I could have talked about. You know, why did we rush through it so quickly? Yeah. And uh, so then I'm reading through it again. I'm like, God showed me other stuff, you know, in here. And I'm thinking, how come I didn't see it back then? Well, maybe sometimes you just don't see everything at once. Uh -huh. You know, you look at a beautiful, like the Grand Canyon and you go, whoa. And then you come back the next day and you go, hey, I don't remember seeing that or that, you know, that layer on the strata or that trail going down. <clears throat> Sometimes you just can't take it all in. So here's what I want to do. I want to just go back through chapter one, talk about some things, and then I'm going to ask you some questions because I think, well, I know this is in the Bible for our learning. Okay. And so when we look at this event that happened thousands of years ago, it, it's relevant to us today, right where we are. We can put ourselves in a lot of this situation and we can learn from how God responded or how God was at work. And he's the same God. So let's look at Ruth chapter one again. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just go over a couple of the main points. And I scribbled down a couple things that I wanted to talk about. But when I read Ruth chapter 1, <clears throat> what I come away with is how desperate the situation was. I mean, this is, remember we said the book of Judges is a pretty rough time. Everyone did that which was right. There was a cycle, left God, persecution, deliverer, come back to God, then they leave God, then persecution from the neighboring, then a judge. It's over and over and over, all through the book of Judges. Bad time. And things got so worse. Remember we said at the end of Judges, they're fighting among themselves. Then you got that guy who chopped up somebody and sent the parts. We won't go into that. But it got really bad. And then you start the book of Ruth, <clears throat> and you think, oh, finally we're out of Judges. Things will get so much better. <laughs> it gets really bad. And then we focus in not on the nation, but on one person and how it affected one family rather than the nation. So we're kind of like zeroing in. So remember in chapter one, there's three things that happened in, Ru in Ruth. Well, she wasn't there at the beginning because it was Naomi and Elimelech and his two sons. But remember, they started out in verse 1, there was a famine. So you have a natural disaster. Remember, we said mm -hmm. three things. Yeah. Then you have human tragedy. Right. So when they go down to Moab, they left because of a natural disaster, the famine. They go to Moab, which is on the other side of the Dead Sea and down. So they had to cross the Jordan and go down the west side to the land of the Moabites. Remember who the Moabites were? They were descendants of Lot. Lot. And his eldest daughter, the ancestral relationship there of Lot and his daughter didn't start out good. And the Moabites were a thorn in the side of the Israelites forever. Uh, and then the Ammonites, that's the second son that was born to the youngest, younger daughter. So you remember your history, that's in Genesis. So you have a natural disaster. They go down to the land of the Moabites. Then you have human tragedy. So Elimelech, remember what his name means? Eli El means God. Lemech is king. God is my king. Mm -hmm. What a great name. God is my king. Mm -hmm. He dies. Mm -hmm. All right? And so who's left? Naomi and her two sons. Mm -hmm. And I told you that one of them is Chilon. The other is, uh, what is it? Melon. 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 One means weak and the other means sickly and the other is wasting <laughs> not great names you want to call your kids but they were basically not in good health <laughs> yeah very sickly so you got human tragedy not just she lost her husband but then she loses 
the two, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's verse five. Malon, Chilon died, <laughs> both of them. <clears throat> so here's a woman, Naomi, left with two Moabitess daughters. So I said that we had, first of all, what was it? Natural disaster. Right. Then we had human tragedy, but we had disobedience. Yes. Now that was the one they were, in, they were in control of. You can't control the other two. But they certainly could have controlled their disobedience. Mm -hmm. Because in Deuteronomy verse, chapter 7, it says, You shall not take wives of the neighboring tribes. And they did. Direct disobedience. Now you can say, oh, well, they were living in Moab. Yeah, but God had told them not to do that. And just put that kind of back in your thought because later on in the chapter when we look at what Naomi is saying, I think that has a lot to do with what she says. I think, even though it's not clearly stated, I think this disobedience was on her mind when she talked about what has happened to her. Okay, so you had those three things. So then what's going on? Well, <clears throat> they left the house of bread, Beth Lechem, house of bread, because there was famine. But then she hears that back in the country, verse 6, uh, there was, it says, she heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Famine's over after 10 years. So she hears. So, what's she do? Well, she tries to tell her daughters, stay here. Don't come back with me. A couple things to think about. <clears throat> Why would she tell her daughters not to come back to Israel? Well, think about it. Number one, they wouldn't be welcome necessarily. Moabite girls were not welcome in Israel. So that may be part of it. There might be some other, any other reasons you can think of why she would tell them, stay here, don't come back with me. Yeah, that's right. She didn't have any ways for them. Right. <clears throat> okay. And they were Gentiles. So remember, she is. And it might point out their sin. That's true. <laughs> She's a disadvantaged widow with no children. How is she possibly going to take care of her daughter-in-laws? Yeah. Right? She has no children. I was reading one commentator said, um, and he can't prove it. Nobody can prove it. But it could be, think about this. Naomi had gone with her father or her husband and two sons to a distant land because of the famine. But now they're coming back. And to bring those daughters back, she would have to explain everything. She could have possibly just come back on her own and slip back into society, right? Yep. But walking back into town, everyone's going to ask, hey, where's, where's Elimelech? Where's Malon? Where's Sickly? Where's Wasting? <laughs> you know, where are those boys? Then she'd have to explain the whole. And who are these girls? What, they're Moabitess? Girls? Yeah. She has to admit there's Yeah. So it could be. I'm just throwing it. We're not told exactly, but we are told that she made a big deal about stay here. Don't come back with me. She really impressed on them. Stay here. All right. <clears throat> so verse 7, she went forth out of her place with the two daughter-in-law, and they went their way to return. But Naomi said, verse 8, Two daughters, go return each to your mother, to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me, with the dead, and with, and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. This week, Kitty and I were at this conference, and I thought it was interesting. It w this wasn't mentioned at the conference, but look at Naomi's words. The Lord, this is verse 9, the Lord grant you that you find rest in the house of your husband. Marriage is supposed to be a place where there's rest. Mm -hmm. Not supposed to be a place of chaos. I think she had the right idea about marriage. The home is supposed to be a, a, 
a safe place, right? So what's she saying? Go home to your home, find a husband, and you'll be at rest. What a great blessing to give to those girls. Marriage should be, I wrote in my Bible, marriage should bring rest. Sadly, that's not the way it is. In this conference we were at, um, some of the speakers were saying, uh, you know, talking to the guys, don't bring your stress back to the house. Leave it at the door. One of the guys said, look, he, come, he, he has a lot of stress in his job, so he comes and he has garage time. Now, he lives in Chicago, so he has a garage, but he pulls in, turns the key off because he's not going to kill himself with carbon yeah. monoxide, <laughs> not keep the car running, put the door down, and he said sometimes he's in there 45 minutes, and his wife knows. Yeah. Don't talk to him when he's having his garage time. And what is that? He's just saying, God, I got to leave this stuff behind. Please help me the minute I walk in that house that I bring peace to this home. Not bringing my work home with me and not bringing all my stress. Can you guess what his job is? Oh, he's, a he's a pastor. Oh, no, he's a pastor. <laughs> in, Chicago. in Chicago, of all places. Ooh. There's shootings and all oh, kinds of yeah. stuff around there. It's not an easy job. But Ooh. if he has to do that, yeah. so I'm just throwing that out to you guys. Mm -hmm. Guys, the home is supposed to be a place of rest. Mm -hmm. Leave it behind. Do whatever you have to do that when you get home, you're not bringing all that garbage in. Are you following me here? And women, I think the same thing. I mean, you're also supposed to help each other. That's true. There's got to be a balance. Oh, yeah. But if you walk in the door cussing and swearing and throwing things and everything, really, are you bringing peace in the door? That's what I'm saying. Now, true. Yeah. And so... I'm just throwing that out as one example. Obviously, there's other ones, but what what amazing thing that Naomi said, the Lord grant you that you find rest in the house of your husband. And she kissed them and lifted up their voice and wept. I mean, this is emotional. She's really trying to tell these girls, girls, stay here. Don't come with me. <clears throat> I find it interesting in verse 6, 7, and 8 there that Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law mm -hmm. that she might return. She went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return. It was like she, they weren't packing up the house and making that decision. They had already decided they were going with her. At least they had started out on the trek. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way it really came to her that this might be a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Could be, yeah. <clears throat> I want to comment, though. I, I, I wrote something in the margin of my Bible as I was reading this again. What is it that Naomi heard in Moab that caused her to come back to Judah? What was it that she heard? Yeah. Famine. The Lord Look at the Lord back. had visited his people. That's six. in verse six. six. Thank you. you know, in the book of Romans, it says, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. I thought about that. Just, just a little side issue here, side point. What is it that attracts us to God? What is it that causes us to go toward him? The Bible says it's his kindness. It's not his anger. Yes, yes, he's angry with sin. But it's his kindness that attracts us to him. It leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. There's something about God's kindness that strikes a chord in our heart, a responsive chord. I guess I think about that with food bank. You know, we keep telling the workers, the volunteers, we try to remind ourselves, put a smile on your face, you know, say, God bless you. How's your day? The tendency 
after you've had so many people go through the line and some of them are grumpy and they, you know, just, they just want their food and get out of there or they complain about not getting dog food. <laughs> you know how that is. <laughs> is to say, so I'm, I'm going to wipe this smile off my face. They don't deserve a smile. But you know what? We reflect the character of God. It's the kindness of God and his people that attract people to him. You can't forget that. It's not anger. Anger does not attract anyone to God. It's a kindness. Are you all following me here? Mm -hmm. And so, like it says in 8, the Lord deal kindly with you mm -hmm. as you have dealt with the dead and with yeah. me. She was attracted. She was made the decision to go back to Judah because God had dealt kindly with Israel and, and uh, made the the famine go away. So let's keep going. So she says in verse 11, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? And we talked about this, the fact that Naomi has in her mind the kinsman redeemer. This was something that in Deuteronomy it said that when a man died, or when a, yeah, when a man died, the brother had to marry the, sister-in-law, and the firstborn would have the, the name of the, of the original husband who died to continue the line of that person. That was God's law. Now, you could refuse it, and it would go to the next guy, as in the case we're going to see here with Ruth. The first guy in line said, no, nah, I don't want that, and so it went to Boaz. We'll get into that later. But somehow she knew about that, and that's what she says to the, to the daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Look, number one, my husband's dead, so I'm not pregnant with another son. And even if I was, you'd have to wait until that son, you know, got to be of marriageable age. You're going to wait around that long, girls? Because she knew that it fell on the necks on the brother to care for those daughter. -in -law. Are you all following me here? So. Yeah. Kinsman Redeemer, and that's going to come up, by the way, later on in the book. The Kinsman Redeemer. All right. So I want to show you something here. Verse 12. Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they're grown? Says, I'm not even, I don't have a husband, so, you know, how long are you going to wait for this? But look at the word hope in verse 12. I want to focus in on this, because this, this is a really cool word picture. For some reason in the Bible, words are used in settings that give us an idea of the full meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. So here's what I want to do. See the word hope? Mm -hmm. Do I have any hope, she says, if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband? <laughs> Basically, what she's saying is, I can't hope for anything else. It's over. There's nothing to hope for. The word hope is an amazing word. I want you to hold your place. Go to Joshua chapter 2. This is something we looked at when we were studying the book of Joshua. I want to show you what the word hope means, okay? Joshua chapter 2. It's the word tikwa in the, in the Hebrew, but it's the word hope. You don't have to remember that. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 2. Remember the story here? They went to Jericho, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, spies were housed mm -hmm. in Rahab's house. Right. Okay. They made a promise to her that they would... When they got out, she and her family would be safe. What was it that was a symbol of, their, of her hope that this would be fulfilled? Well, let me show you. Verse 16, Joshua 2, 16. You all there? Mm -hmm. She said to them, get you to the mountain lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourselves three days until the pursuers be returned. Afterward, go your way. That was the plan. Get out of here. Go hide wait, and when the pursuers go by, go on by. And, 
And the men said to her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which you have made. Behold, when we come into this land, you will bind this. What's your, what's your Bible say? Line, Line mm-hmm. of scarlet thread. That's the word hope. Line or, or rope or thread or whatever, yarn or whatever you say. It's the word in verse 18, you will bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which you let us down by, and you will bring your father and mother and brethren and all your father's household home to you. All I'm saying is the word hope is the word line. It's the same word. When they said to her, when we come back, here's what you have to hold on to. This is going to be the basis of your hope. The word hope means line, cord. That's what it means. Okay, so put yourself in Rahab's place. The only thing she had to hold on to was that promise they had given. But what was the symbol of the promise? It was that hope, the cord. What an amazing symbol. So those guys take off. Now, did she have any guarantee that they were going to come through on their promise? That the God of Israel? No. But when she looked at that line, that was her reminder. It was the physical reminder of a promise. And the Bible calls it the hope, the line, the cord. Wow. So think about that. It's red. It's red. It's bright. It's there. No one else knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. For her, it meant those guys are coming back. And guess what? God's going to save my family. Mm -hmm. It was all she had to hold on to Mm -hmm. was that little cord. Now, where she got the cord, who knows? Maybe it was something to tie the curtains back. I don't know. But she hung it out the window. Right. (laughs) Yeah, they got out. So here, let's go back to Ruth. With that in mind, that the word hope means the rope, what you hold on to. If you've lost everything else, hold on to that one thing. The promises of God displayed in a rope. And what's Ruth say? I don't even have that. I've lost everything. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight that could bear sons, would you tarry? If I even had hope that I could have a husband, would you even wait around for that? For me to have a kid and then the kid grow and then that kid be the redeemer for you and raise up a son in your Malon or Chilon, whichever one you had married? Here's the point. This woman is desperate. She's like Rahab without a thread. She's that low. She has no hope. Are you all following me here? I know, Cindy, you got a furl in your eyes like, hmm? Does that make sense? I guess. Okay. Yeah. I I, I just didn't think it that that she was saying she didn't have any hope. Or that she had so little Mm -hmm. that it was unreasonable. I thought she was just basically saying it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Well, that's true. Could be that. If I had a husband tonight, what's that going to matter? Yeah. But she is so desperate, she's lost everything. It's still a down thing. It's a yeah. down feeling. Mm-hmm. Okay, so verse 13, would you tarry for them? Talking about the kids. If she was able to have kids, would you stay with them? Nay, my daughters. For it, I underlined the word grieves, because we're gonna this will make sense later on. The word grieve is the word mara. It makes me bitter. Mm-hmm. For your sakes, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She says, I am bitter, not for me, but for your sakes. Mm -hmm. They're realizing not only her own desperate situation, but the the desperation of these daughter-in-laws. They have no future with her, Mm -hmm. with the true God of Israel, because they're Moabites. And the word there, grieve, is the word bitter, Mara. And you'll know in chapter 2, remember when she goes back to Bethlehem, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. 
Call me Mara, bitter. Because God has dealt bitterly with me. But here's where she explains the bitterness <clears throat> is for your sakes. Now, what verse 13 says is something interesting, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. The, the term hand of the Lord is usually used for God's judgment. It was in the book of Judges. The hand of the Lord was against them. When they went into sin, he sent persecution. You can read it, Judges chapter 2. Look at Judges 2.15. She knew what this meant. This meant they had messed up and God wasn't pleased. Now, I'm, I'm only going to, you know, I'm not going to press it too far, but look at Judges 15. 2.15. Judges 2.15. The anger of the Lord, verse 14, was hot against Israel, delivered them into the hands of the spoilers. Verse 15, whether, whithersoever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. This is always used in God's judgment of them. They messed up. They left the God of Israel. So God's hand was against them. So here we have Ruth using the same words because she's living during the time of the judges. And she's saying, the hand of the Lord is against me. Now, you have to ask yourself, why would she say that? That was what was used to describe Israel going away from God. In what way has she gone away from God? Well, we might say the disobedience. Remember the first two you have no control over? Yeah. Natural disasters and the family things. Mm -hmm. But disobedience? Yeah, you do. She may be, maybe to get a full picture of what's going on, she's expressing that they messed up by not keeping God's command and mm -hmm. staying away from the people around them and allowing their sons, sons to intermarry. Remember, it wasn't in Deuteronomy where it says, you will not give your sons and your daughters in marriage to the, to the people around. It doesn't say because their genetics are bad, their skin color is bad. It doesn't say that. It says because they will draw your hearts away to idols. Right. It has nothing to do with genetics. It's not because they didn't believe in interracial marriage yeah. and all this. No, it's, it's religious. It's because God knew that if they married the people outside of the Jewish faith, it, they would be drawn away, their hearts. So understand that. This, is not, this isn't discrimination in that sense. Isn't it's that to similar, remain pure. Isn't it similar today that the Jewish people wouldn't want you to marry a Catholic? I would imagine it's yeah. similar, yeah. yes. I've heard that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, because they believe you're going outside the faith. Yeah. yeah. And vice versa, Catholics too. Right. You weren't ever supposed to marry outside. That's true. Right. And the Bible does say, don't right. be unequally yoked. We as believers need to have spouses who are on the same path we are. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Well, and the question would be, are are we under the law? Well, we're not under the law. No, but still. But the principles are there. Right. The principles of, look, you know what's going to happen if you marry someone who's not walking the same. Can you be equally yoked? No, you can't. You can't have light and darkness in the same place. Okay, so in verse 13, she says, it grieves me. I'm bitter. What for? For your sakes. Because what? The hand of the Lord is against me. One of the commentators I was reading said this. Could it possibly be that she, in her bitterness, realized that if these girls continued to associate with her, they would have further judgment yeah, yeah, yeah. because of what God had allowed in their life, in, in the life of Elimelech, the two boys, that you, you should just go, <laughs> you know, God's... God's really dealing a, a hard thing to us here, and it'd be better if you just aren't a part of this. Yeah. I don't know. You might take it that far. We don't, say, we don't know. But we do know she's telling these girls, go home. Right? Yeah. So it gives you a little picture of, of maybe what's going on in her mind. 
she's experienced incredible loss. And she's telling these girls, go home, just, just go, go back. Go find rest in, in your own homes. Because the Lord, it says, the hand of the Lord has gone against me. Wow. All right. And they lifted up their voice, verse 14, wept. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave. Interesting, there's a difference between a, a kiss and a, and a hug, right? A kiss is done. Hug is, <laughs> hold on. So which one's kissing, which one's hugging? Well, Orpah, the one who leaves, gives a kiss and on her way, right? Yeah. Ruth Clave. Uh -huh. So if you have a choice to give a kiss or a hug, give a hug, right? Mm -hmm. All right, all right. No, that's not really in the Bible. <laughs> all right. You all can comment on this if you like. I mean, I'm just, I'm reading the verses. All right. Well, cleaving is something that God says in the Old Testament, the, and he repeats it in the New Testament, that the man will leave his father and mother and cleave to right. his wife, right. and the two shall become one flesh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one, verse 15. What's that? Yes. Also to leave because they interrupt her grieving for her sons. Oh, oh. Hmm. it's an idea. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. If she knows that they that they are able to go get married again and live their mm -hmm. lives, then she won't have to have this constant reminder. Yeah, could be of her loss. It might be hard yeah. for her to have a, be a part of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hurt too much. That's a good. That's a good. Yeah. Yeah. Insight there. Yeah. But look at verse 15. This, this, this baffles me. She says, Behold, your sister-in-law is gone. Orpah has gone back mm -hmm. to her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Um, it's just interesting that she recognizes that Orpah has gone back to her gods. Yes. Mm -hmm. The god Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. And she says to Ruth, Return. You do the same. I know. I, it just strikes me as, I don't know if I could tell my sister-in-law, go back over there where I know it's evil. <laughs> and I know they worship the wrong God. I don't know. But we don't have the whole picture. We're just, this is just the narrative, you know. This is the time of the judges. Yeah, that's true. Were, were, they, were they into, were they... Jewish people, were they uh, into converting other, other people into a religion? Or not? Proselytizing, there, there was a little bit of that. There are, there are different cases in the Old Testament where people came to check out the religion of the Jews, mm -hmm. became proselytes, which we, we talked about last week. She does. She, verse 16, by the way, this is more than just what we would call an address change. Look at verse 16. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee, for wherever you go, I'll go. Hey, where your home is, I want to be there. I want your address. Well, it's that, but it's more than that too, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Look at first, and where you lodge, I will lodge, and your people, and here's where it is deep. This is the life change. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Yeah. What I... God yeah. that way. She's fully embracing the God of the Jews. Yes. But notice she doesn't say the God. Whose God is it? God. Thy God. Thy God. Yeah. Which tells me something. Now I'm not going to read fully into this. How did she know the God of the Israelites? She'd never been to Israel. She's a Moabitess. How did she come to know the God of Israel? She came to know the God of Israel through Naomi. Naomi. Yeah. It was Naomi's God she's talking about. Right. Which tells me something, that Naomi displayed mm -hmm. the true character of God, at least mm -hmm. at some point. And she made a choice to follow the God of Naomi, your God. You see there? That's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Well, the Israelites made a big deal out of the fact that their God, well, A, that their God was the true God, but also... 
I think all the people around them knew mm. he's the God of the Israelites. Right. The God of the Israelites. <clears throat> so she probably knew that the Israelites had a God mm -hmm. that was the God of the Israelites. Yeah. Before she even married her husband, I'm sure. And David. you remember oh, sorry. You remember that the whole calendar, the Jewish calendar, revolved around seven feasts. Right. I mean, all year long, they're having these parties, you know, yeah. and the Jewish people do it. So you want to come to know their God, Big come parties. to their parties, you know, because yeah. all their parties point to a different character, a different part of God. Mm -hmm. and David had said, are the Jews, were the Jews proselytizing? Well, remember Jesus, when he drove out the money changers, he said, it is written. And that was Old Testament. Yeah. My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and there the are other parts of the scripture that say yeah. that it's through the Israelites that the whole world is going to see who mm -hmm. God is. Mm -hmm. So if they weren't proselytizing, there's something wrong. They should have been. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering if at that time, at that age, were they doing that? Probably not. Sure it's hard when you're conquering their lands. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the, but come to the world. Yeah. 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 That's true. There too yeah. Because they are they're also supposed to stay away from all these other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think it's because then they're supposed to, I think God's intent might have desired would have mm -hmm. been for them to live the godly life and other people would be automatically drawn in yeah. by what they see. Yeah. yeah. Well, remember, what, let's remember about Rahab. When the spies came, remember what she said, we know what your God did. Yes. Over in, in Egypt. And that was 40 years before. We know how your God did this and that and that. And she quoted, she actually told some of the miracles that God had done. So the people around knew that there was a pretty powerful God with these Israelites. Because uh, uh, the Moabites were, were beaten back quite a few times mm -hmm. by the Israelites yeah. in Exodus. But they came back. They came back. <laughs> yeah. But you know, when God gave the law... He also gave ways for people, to Gentiles, to become proselytes of Judaism. Well, well, yeah, when he, when he gave the law, mm -hmm. there were Gentiles there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, they left Egypt with Gentiles. Right. There were a mixed company that came out, yeah. And God gave the law to all those people. And he, yeah. and he gave ways for strangers to That's come right. in. That's mm right. -hmm. Yeah. Can I share a verse? Yes. Jeremiah 31, 3, which is my life verse. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So he is constantly drawing mm -hmm. to himself. I love that verse. It's a great verse. Yeah, it is. Okay, so 17, she truly identifies with the God of Israel. Where thou diest, will I die? There will I be buried. Now, wait a minute. Naomi's gone back to Judah. Yeah, but Ruth says, I not only want your God, but I want to be buried back in that land. I'm going to be there. That I'm making that choice. And if, more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking to her. That's interesting because it took Ruth's sincere words of, look, I'm with you, Ruth. Don't tell me to go back. Don't push me away anymore. I'm not going. Basically is what she said. Yeah. Stop. But Ruth, uh, Naomi's really trying to get her to go, go, go. We see uh, Love comes into, into this. Oh, yeah. Uh, it says we've seen tragedy, mm -hmm. and uh, we now see love coming mm -hmm. into, yeah. into focus. Yeah. And when they own <clears throat> So they went, verse 19, until they came to Bethlehem, house of bread came to pass, and they were come to Bethlehem. Now, I want to show you something here. That all the city was moved about them, and they said, sad to tell you, the King James doesn't translate this right. In the Hebrew, it's the women. It's the feminine form of they. Right. So we don't have that in English. We don't have masculine, feminine verbs and nouns and all that, or, or nouns. 
but other languages do. This is women. They are the women, not the men, the women. They said, is this Naomi? Now, you have to ask yourself the question, why did Naomi run into the women first? Well, it's during the barley harvest. We're going to see that. The men are out in the fields. What are the women doing? Well, maybe taking water to the men. I don't know. Well. Going to the well. Yeah. Making sandwiches. Or home, making sandwiches. Yeah. The men are all out. It's pretty clear here. Naomi walks into town with Ruth, and the women come. And they go, is this Naomi? Now, she's been gone for 10 years. Wow. It could be she had changed. I don't know. Do we change in 10 years? <laughs> well, I guess we do. Well, when you go through a death with your husband well, and your sons, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So you can see the women going. They're in there making sandwiches, washing pots and pans. And here comes two women walking down the road. And they're going, is that Naomi? Hey, yeah. is that Naomi? Yeah. Is that Naomi? You know, and then... The word gets spread around. You know, the, they say there's three forms of communication, telephone, telegraph, and tell a woman. No. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway. So I don't know. Well, all right, all right. Oh, don't throw things at me. Stop. Hey, is there a... <laughs> <laughs> Who's doing all the praying? We got to hey, we got to delete something here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm in bad shape now. When I get home, I'm going to hear about that. Marriage weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should have seen her expression. <laughs> no, but isn't it interesting? Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. 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 That's true. We got we guys need the women to communicate. All right, boy, I saved myself then, didn't I? Guess. We could be a fly on the wall on Saturday mornings when you have breakfast. Oh yeah, right. So verse nineteen, the women are asking the question, really, is this her? Is this her? And she says to them, there's the again the female, the women. Call me not Naomi. Now, remember, Naomi means pleasant. pleasant. Yeah. Naomi. Call me Mara. Oh, same word we just looked at when she said, I'm bitter. I'm bitter because of what, uh, for your sakes. Remember that? What verse was that? Let's go back and see it. Um, verse 13. For I am bitter for your sakes. It grieves me. Same word. So don't call me pleasant. And then she says, you got to see this. Call me Mara, bitter, for the Almighty. That's the word El Shaddai. I said that, I think, during our prayer. Mm -hmm. Hath dealt very bitterly Mara with me. Mm -hmm. El Shaddai. Where, where, do you remember where that came up in the Bible? Remember, God reveals himself to his people at different times. He's called... El Elyon, the God of armies, El Shaddai, the Almighty, Adonai, the Lord. There's all these names of God. Where did where did they come from? Well, God at specific times in history, when he appeared to people, he would say, I am, and he would mention his name. Mm -hmm. This is when he met with Abraham in, in Genesis 17 and said, I am El Shaddai, and you're going to have a kid. He said, no, he said, I you walk it. before me and be thou perfect. Okay, but he does later on repeat his, his promise. Look, I can do anything, right? I am almighty. Genesis 17.1. Who's 99? For the Lord, for the almighty, has dealt very bitterly with me. Hmm. Now think a minute. Think a minute. If God is almighty, and he deals bitterly with me, let me, let me read something here. Is this on? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. No, I wrote it down here. Here's what a famous uh, speaker, Spurgeon, said. It's folly to contend with the Almighty, but it's our duty to submit to him. Mm -hmm. It's folly to contend with him, but it's our duty to submit. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? 
When, when you're talking about the Almighty, can you really complain to the Almighty? I mean, if he has allowed something, let me read a couple things here. This is from a little bit further back. When, when uh, Ruth says, your God will be my God, 10 years of Naomi's compromise in Moab what this one guy says. They shouldn't have even been there. They shouldn't have compromised and had their kids marry Moabitess. Never made Ruth confess her allegiance to the God of Israel. Yet as soon as Naomi stood and said, I'm going back to the God of Israel, I'll put my fate in his hands. In other words, I truly trust him. He's dealt bitterly with me, but he's still the Almighty, and I'm going back. Ruth stood with her. Listen to this. If you think you will persuade your friends or relatives to Jesus by compromise and living in sin, you are mistaken. Perhaps you're sincere, but you're mistaken. Only with a bold stand for Jesus, no matter what, that will really do it. Ah, you never win any soul to the right by a compromise and by living in sin. It is a decision for Christ and his truth as the greatest power in the family and the greatest power in the world. Spurgeon. So what he's saying is, when Naomi said, he's dealt bitterly with me, but he's still the almighty God, and I'm going back to be where he is. That rocked Ruth. It wasn't the 10 years of living in, with the Moabites. It's when she took a stand and accepted at the hand of God, whatever the Almighty sends my way, I still trust him. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of faith that Ruth took hold of. <clears throat> now let me read this. Um, Naomi made her most crucial point. If even God was after her to follow her home, was to court personal disaster. Her earlier tragedies, famine, exile, bereavement, childlike, childlessness might be the only the beginning. One ought to shun such a person to escape misfortune. What better argument made to return to Moab? What he's basically saying is this. Ruth was saying, look, God has dealt bitterly with me. I still trust him. Why don't you just go home? Because I don't know what God has for me yet. He's not done working with me. And I don't want you to be hurt by this anymore. Wow. You're already hurt. You lost your husband, whichever one, Malin, Chillon. Just go home. Mm -hmm. But Ruth is impacted, I think, by Naomi's full trust in God. Mm -hmm. And desire to go back to God. Some people say when you have a calamity, the worst thing to do is run away from God. The best thing is run toward God, right? You run away from God. Does that make it any better? No. No, it makes it worse. Yeah. But that's what we see Naomi doing. And that impacted Ruth. Well, let's keep going. The Almighty, the El Shaddai, has dealt bitterly with me. She's honest. Is there anything wrong with honesty? I mean, you see a woman here who's hurting, mm -hmm. but she's honest. Verse 21, look what she says. She says, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty. Boy, she's being honest. Yeah. She reminds me of Job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, she's yeah. not dishonoring God, but mm -hmm. she's telling it like it is. Yeah. yeah. And is it wrong to pour out your heart and say, God, I don't like this? Yeah. I don't like it, it's not wrong. but you're still God. Yeah. She never curses God. Remember yeah. what Job's wife said, curse God and die. Right. Come on, Job. She do he doesn't. She doesn't. And he, it says, I went out full. The Lord brought me home empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord testified against me? And El Shaddai has afflicted me. El Shaddai has afflicted me. Mm. So It's one thing to have... Uh, to acknowledge where your uh, bad happenings or I don't want to say bad luck has come from. 
Amen. It's another thing to reject God himself mm. yeah. through it. Well, she yeah. never blames him. Well, she says he's, he's the one doing it. He's allowed it. It's not, I guess she's just saying this is what happened. That's mm -hmm. right. He testified against me. He's judging me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yet right she doesn't say, but I don't believe in him right. or I'm going right. to run I away say, from him. She doesn't ever say he's bad. There's no yeah. objection. Her attitude is right. Yeah, mm -hmm. she submits yeah. to it. And she's right. expressing hurt, though. Sure. Definitely expressing that she's hurt. Sure. And this is not a fun experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Let me read this for you. I, could, I thought of this verse when I thought of this uh, whole scenario here. Whether you want to go to the extreme of saying, look, this is God's punishment for, for them and their disobedience or not, it seems like she feels that way that God has worked, but Hebrews 12, 11 says this. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews 12, 11. Here's what God says. No discipline is fun. But when you look back on it, when God allows certain things and it makes you better, then it does, it says here, produce peaceable fruit of righteousness. It produces something in you. And sometimes that's what it takes to produce that. So it seems like in Ruth's life, she's acknowledging that God has allowed this and she's coming. Now, she, she hasn't experienced, it's not like she's looking back and going, you know, things are so great now. I can see why all this happened. Mm -mm. There's no <laughs> resolution. She's still as worse off as she was before. It's just now she's headed back home. And now she's got to answer all these people. Like, mm -hmm. what happened? What'd you do? Yeah. What's going on? Stare you look her, different. Staring her in the face. You're bitter. My home being surrounded with her people. Yeah. Maybe she's thinking, I can get right with God. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Better belongs. than where she was yeah. before. Because that's where she belongs. Yeah. Is with her people. She's wow. her faithfulness towards God. Yeah. So I think a couple of takeaways. Let me just wrap it up with this. It's okay to be honest with God. Mm -hmm. You don't like what's going on. I mean, I don't think any of us have experienced these three things. Natural disaster, human tragedy, and well, disobedience we have, but... Have we ever gone to this extent to lose husband and two sons and be left alone? They didn't have social security back then, no free handouts from the government. She had no income. She would have to depend on people the rest of her life. Yeah. She's a disadvantaged widow that's childless. Think about it. Yeah. How bad off is that? And yet what's she saying? The Almighty recognizing El Shaddai, the God who can... Give a kid to a 99-year-old man. He's the same guy who's dealing with me. And I'm going to go back home and do whatever we have to do to get back on our feet. Mm -hmm. Best thing, so number one, it's okay to be honest with God. Just be honest. Mm -hmm. But now don't curse God, but be honest with him. Recognize his position, his place. He's El Shaddai, but... Things have gone really hard for us. And go back home. When God begins to draw you, go. Not necessarily home, but go where God is drawing you. It's his kindness that draws you. Go toward him, not away from him in the difficulties. Y'all following me there? Because what does Satan want to do? He wants to use the difficulties to draw us away from him, not toward him. So remember the verse of Matthew 7, 7? Seek and you shall find. Old Testament, Jeremiah. If you seek me, you will find me. So there's the key. It may not be the natural thing you want to do, but do it. Do the right thing. Seek God, you'll find him. And what's amazing is here, Ruth chose the God of Israel to identify with that. She sought the God of Israel and he helped her. And the story just gets better from here on. But it was pretty bad for a while. Okay, any other 
lessons that you all can see in this? I mean, there's... I'm just continually struck when I read this by the thought that this woman, she feels like she's being judged, and maybe she is, and but her choice is to go back, and she's traveling alone. That's the thing that keeps striking me. She's going all the way back to Judah as a lone, mm. middle-aged or more woman. Yes. That was the buy for her life. The buy her looks. Mm -hmm. When she went left, left, she had her husband and her sons, you know, with her and everything. She's traveling alone. Yeah. yeah. In the middle of nowhere. That's got to show a lot of faith right there. Yeah. I what strikes me too is Ruth's <coughs> complete humility mm. and her, you know, her adoration of Naomi. I mean, really, you think about it as a young girl, she's still a young woman, mm -hmm. and she's going to go back and live with an old woman. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound really promising. And yeah. to a high, she's never been. <laughs> right? You know, a lot of unknowns. No visible means of support, right? Hey. Ernie, can you turn this off now? Because I'm going to be. Psalm 30, verse 5, if you want to write that down somewhere, it says, weeping may endure for the evening, but joy comes in the morning. And it's a, it's a verse that is used.